So I'm Danny Hales from Alliance Group. I'm also a member of the DINS board. Uh, Alliance Group is uh, pleased to be supporting uh, this session this afternoon, science strategy, and in particular, uh, as the presentation relates to the Deer Progeny Test, or DPT. Alliance Group was involved back around 12, 13 years ago with the um, development of the Central Progeny Test uh, for the for sheep farmers, and about four years ago, uh, got involved with uh, in a collaboration with Ag Research, Deer Research, and Landcorp, uh, along with some innovative farmers, to uh, commence the establishment of the Deer Progeny Test. So it's um, our pleasure to be to be involved, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you, although many of you will know these two gentlemen. Uh, but we've got Dr. Jeff Asher uh, here to my left, and also Jamie Ward, who will be presenting uh, and telling us a bit about uh, the initial, some of the initial results from the Deer Progeny Test, which uh, you may recall is, uh, has been a three, essentially a three-year project. So we're now getting to the exciting stage where we've actually we'll actually get some some decent results that will be able to be used by deer farmers to help with uh, profitability on farm. Yes. Uh, thanks, Danny, and um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for allowing us to speak to you today. Last year at Methven, you may recall, I got up and talked about progress in the DPT and or the Deer Progeny Test, and, and I promised you that this year we'd be starting to present some results. So the reality is we're, uh, it's a very complex study and the actual physical work has been ongoing for three years for three crops of progeny. And we've completed the physical work apart from some maternal trait work. And now we're in the, the I guess, the, the sharp end of the ax, and that is the actual analysis of that data, which is an incredibly big data set and a very complex analysis. What we're gonna to do today between Jamie and myself is uh, give you a snapshot of some of the more interesting stuff around growth and the venison traits. But just be aware there's a lot more to the deer progeny test than just that. And over time, as we develop the analysis, there will be more stuff coming out of it as well. So I'll do a bit of a recap uh, here on the deer progeny test. It won't take too long, but just to get you back into the flow of it. The DPT is a, um, a central progeny test uh, run on commercial farms, so it's important to acknowledge that this is not run on stud farms. This is a real-life commercial farm situation where we've taken top stags onto those farms uh, with the aim of improving venison production. So it's, it's a very strong venison focus, not a velvet focus. And you'll notice there that there are a number of primary aims uh, and last year, I focused on the linkage between herds. Now, this was arguably probably the most important aspect of the deer progeny test to keep the linkage between the stud herds uh, going or reinforcing it because it was starting to slip. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that to a great deal of detail today, today because I covered it uh, fairly well last year. Really, what we're interested in today, uh, two and three, the Firstly, the platform to evaluate breeding values across the different breed types, and by that I mean the red deer and the wapiti breed types. And to evaluate new traits for optimization of selection goals, but obviously we're not going to cover all the traits today, uh, mainly the carcass traits or the, the meat traits. But also remember that it's also a starting point for evaluating maternal traits, so that's ongoing. Uh, we have retained maternal females for a number of years and we'll be monitoring their reproductive productivity. And also establishing a very well phenotyped or described population of animals for future genomic tools, so those are DNA tools. To give you a, a quick uh, summary of uh, the actual scope of size of the deer progeny test, now. Most of this has been published previously in the Deer Industry News, so I'm really just recapping a few figures for a bit of background. Um, we had 
across the three years of producing progenies, we had over 2,400 inseminations across nearly 1,600 hinds uh, across three separate farms. Now, Invermay was one of those farms, but still run as a commercial farm rather than a stud unit. And the other two farms were White Rock Station and Halden Station. 35 sires were used across those three years with link sires between years. And these represent 24 maternal sires and 11 terminal sires. So what we mean by maternal, and Jamie will describe this in more detail, are red deer type sires, Western Scottish type red deer, and by terminal whoppity type sires. Now the reason we use that terminology because the boundaries between the two are a little bit fuzzy in places because of hybridisation and no purebreds really exist in the system. But do think upon it as maternal red deer terminal whoppity type size. We weaned 1,647 progeny across that time, which was 68% to wean to AI, which actually is quite good. And of that, 950 progeny were killed in their first year for the venison trait. So that's just about all the progeny except the maternal female lines, which have been retained as live animals. So uh, of the um, 1,300 uh, um, maternal progeny weaned, there were 700 males and 656 females, uh, 290 odd terminal progeny weaned, so uh, we had less size represented in that line, uh, 158 males, 133 females. Of that, 950 progeny were slaughtered. So all the terminal progeny, males and females, all the whoppity type progeny were slaughtered, but only the male maternal lines were slaughtered. We measured a lot of things. <laughs> so this is what we call phenotyping. We had over 150 measurements recorded on each animal before it finally uh, left the system. Uh, a lot of those were meat traits. So when we slaughtered the animals, we had a lot of uh, live and post-slaughter uh, meat traits recorded. Uh, uh, some of those were CT scanning traits. We recorded traits around co-products. So that's uh, skins, tails, pizzles. We looked at venison colour stability sensory traits, which are still ongoing work at the moment, looking at the sensory attributes of the venison produced. Temperament traits, carla traits, carla being the, pro, the antibody produced in the saliva to ingestion of worms, so looking for traits around resistance to parasitism. And also we've got the maternal traits under the dam. So all in all, a lot of things being measured there. And the complexity of this data, I, I can't under, understate, to be honest. Um, we have to look at each of these traits relative to one another in what we call a matrix. And that matrix has 10,000 odd squares in it. So we have to look at all that and make rational decisions around it. So it's, it's a big job. And all we're actually going to be able to present today is to touch upon some of that around some of these traits and the meat side of it and the growth. Now, unfortunately, with any talk around genetics, there is a little bit of jargon, and we've tried to minimise it as much as possible. But there are two things that we want you to focus on that are indicators of the opportunity of the industry to make genetic progress. The first one is what we call heritability, which is sometimes abbreviated to H2H squared. Heritability is we calculate it from all this data involving all the progeny data and all their pedigrees and their performance. And it is a measure of how much of a trait measurement that we can attribute to genetics alone and not just environment. So when we have a heritability of zero, not good for us from genetic point of view because it means that there is no genetic driver behind the variation in that trait. Not common we see that, but there are traits like that, and it simply means that if we're going to make progress there, we have to do it environmentally through management. And then at the other end of the scale is a heritability of one, which is absolute genetic control. And such things like coat colour in animals 
is what we call a high heritability or, or, or a heritability of one, but not necessarily a useful production trait. Most of the production traits that we're interested in sit between the low, moderate and high. So 0.2 is a low trait and reproductive traits would fit in that character, character, uh, category, having a degree of heritability but quite low. Moderate traits about 0.2 to 0.4 and very high traits for production traits would have heritabilities greater than 0.4. So try and keep those figures in mind because we're going to come back to them and the various components of the talk. So uh, examples of moderate uh, traits, uh, heritability traits, weaning weight would be one, around that 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Examples of very high heritable traits, antler traits. There's a very good reason why New Zealand made such dramatic progress in antler production in, New Zealand, uh, in the last 20 years, is we have a trait that's so highly heritable and visible. Even though it's not expressed in the female, it's visible and it's easy to select for. The other thing we need to understand is the variation around the trait. Now this is a difficult one for us and what we're presenting here is a, is a, a, a figure that we don't normally use genetically, but when we start talking about standard deviations, people just switch off. So what Jamie and I tried to do is express it in a different way is what we call a coefficient of variation. It's the percentage of variation around the mean. Um, and it's to try and give you a feel for the real level of variation relative to the size of the trait that we're measuring. And, and um, in this case, a low variation is anything less than 3% coefficient of variation. Moderately high variation is between 3 and 10, and anything over 10% coefficient variation is very high level of variation. So the concept we're getting here is that if you have a heritability that's high, and you have a variation for that trait's high, you have a combination where you're able to make very rapid progress and selection for a particular trait. The converse of the heritability is low, and the variation is low, there's not much opportunity at all. And so there's various combinations around that. So keep those two things in mind, heritability and coefficient of variation, because they'll pop up through this as we talk. Um, so the DPT, um, I'll go back to linkage and just say that the DPT has been very, very successful in the herd linkage objectives within DS Select. And I'll put a quote up there from one of the DPT partner herds uh, members who said, without the DPT, there'd be no deer select now. And really what, I don't necessarily agree fully with that, but it was a signal that the linkage was falling apart and the value of the breeding values and offered in DPT was sort of starting to lose their meaning and value to the farmers. What the DPT has done is pulled that together. We've got a very, very high level of linkage in the growth traits between in the red herds and the wapiti herds, and, uh, and improvements in the other traits as well. The, the deer progeny test has also provided uh, a lot of new, uh, in, new industry benchmarks. So you'll see some of the growth tracking graphs that are coming up at the moment for people to plot their performance of animals. A lot of that's based around the DPT data as well but also that the DPT is a very large data set for the deer industry and has absolutely no equivalent globally. By other industry standards, it's not a big data set. Uh, you know, a, a central progeny test thing would, might have 10,000 progeny, but for the size of the industry, it's a massive data set. And um, it's gonna take a year or two for us to work through it all. Uh, in order to look at all the traits. So just to cap this portion of the talk, and I'll, I'll cross over to Jamie very very soon, but um, the next three talks, uh, Jamie's going to talk about the live weight traits in the DPT. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about the venison and the, ven and the carcass traits, and then Jamie's going to finish off with the co-product traits. Thanks, Jeff. So, in regard to live weight, it's nothing particularly new for the deer industry in a lot of ways. It's been on deer select for a long time. 
Um, Utilisation of that perhaps is, is questionable, as, as that quotation pointed out. But the big thing about the DPT is the animals that are actually being measured and how they were being measured. So it's that combination of the maternal, the red animals, and the terminal animals being measured at the same time in the same um, circumstances in the same cohort. That's the big thing about the DPT, and that's been a very important missing link for all, all facets of the deer industry for quite some time when it comes to proper genetic evaluation. So we've got something to deal with along those lines, and, and that's the fact that as it stands at the moment on Deer Select, we have two separate platforms for recording breeding values. We have the red over here, which has been going you know, pretty well for 10 years, and then we have the Wapiti, which hasn't been going for as long and doesn't have as many herds on it. And where the middle of those two is, we, we really didn't have any idea, particularly at the start of the DPT. So just to give you an example of that, I've, I've put these two um, arrows up here. So the DPT sires, their um, weight 12 breeding values range from plus 27.2 kilos down to plus one. All right, so we almost had an average sire in there. The average, however, of those sires was, was very high. It's plus 17.4 kilos for 12 months weight. Now, when it came to the Wapiti sires, they're being evaluated on a different system. The average of those sires was um, plus, rough, roughly plus 11, and then the top sire was about plus 20. And again, the bottom was round about that zero. But when we started this, we really had no decent feeling for where the overlap was actually going to occur between these red production animals and the terminal side uh, Wapiti venison production animals. So a little more look at the sort of historical breeds that are making these up. So we used a, a three breed thing called G breed to look at the historical contributors to the breeds of these animals. And the terminal size ended up at about 78% elk. So they're pretty high proportion of elk genes in there. The terminal progeny, obviously with their common red mothers, had a quite a different breakdown and they ended up about 44% elk, 16% Eastern European red deer, and 40% English. So you can see the, the maternal hind base we had was still... Uh, a very English type maternal base. But when it came to those maternal sires, things got turned around a bit. So on average, 55% Eastern European and 38% um, English. And again, you'll see that switched around again in the maternal progeny, more English than Eastern due to their dam bases. Now, these numbers you'll notice don't totally add up to 100 because they're predicted estimates. So they're never gonna quite hit 100 or zero but don't worry about that, they're just predictions. So, in regard to the DPT, what, what's new about weight from it? And, and one of the big things that's new is if you want to improve something, you first have to measure it. And by measuring these animals very carefully on three different commercial farms across three years, we've established some new benchmarks for um, rising yearling venison production system. So we've got a peg in the ground. We've actually measured that performance across these venison production animals, these maternal and terminal animals. So now we can go on and we can move forward and we can actually quantify the progress that we've made. So this is a slightly separate thing that's come out of the DPT that may not have necessarily been in the full objectives. Now I'm going to present some numbers and these numbers have been adjusted as little as possible because as Steve Carden pointed out, Yesterday, everything very easily gets averaged. So I'm going to present a couple of different graphs and sets of numbers. This first one is as unaveraged as we can give you, so it's basically been adjusted across years and farms. So all we've adjusted for is the year and the farm and the mob any animals we're in. And so this is our live weight trait. We've split this across the four key weight periods that we took for the DPT, so weaning, and weaning was roughly at 100 days, it was basically the start of March, most of our conceptions were reasonably late in the season, start of winter, so around about 1st of June, end of winter, 
which was to us is mid-August, around about the 20th of August, and the 12-month wait. And that, on average, turned out to be a 350-day wait. So we're not quite a full 12 months. As you can see from this, this, this graph's really just to show you the relativities within each sex by um, sire type. So the pink bars are the maternal females that we've retained. The blue bars are our maternal males. And the yellow ones are our terminal females. And then we've got in the good Otago colours, we've got the terminal females in yellow or gold and the um, terminal males in the dark blue. Now, this next graph, again, it's been adjusted slightly differently so we can present all the sires together. So this is also being just adjusted by sex. And unfortunately, what this does is it compresses things together a bit. So these numbers aren't quite as large as the real raw numbers. Uh, this is, for weaning weight, how all of our, these 35 sires ranked within the DPT. Now, you'll notice, sorry, the bottom of this, we start at 40 kilos, so we haven't gone all the way down to zero. You wouldn't really notice the difference. And, and in this plot, the maternal males, again, are the light blue, and the, uh, uh, sorry, all maternals are light blue, and all terminals are the dark blue. And you can see at weaning weight, there's actually some overlap there. So some of our terminal progeny were not weaning quite as heavy as some of our red progeny. Now, those, those differences are pretty small, and the terminal progeny, because they're born five days later on average, you know, that, that could explain some of that as well. But um, the raw mean for all of our weaning weights was 55.6 kilos. Now, if we move on to some of those figures that Jeff was talking about. A heritability is 0.38, which is basically what we use in DSELEC right now, and the coefficient of variation is 10%. So there is, and, and you all know this from your own farms, there's quite a lot of variation around weaning weight. So there is a lot of opportunity for the industry to select. Now, to try and give you an appreciation for the range of opportunities for the industry, I've highlighted the top 10% of DPT progeny, and this will be going right through the rest of the talk, and the bottom 10% of DPT progeny. This is the progeny we had in the DPT, not the size. This is the, of the progeny only. So if you look at the average top weaning weight, we're basically 65 kilos, and the bottom 44 <coughs> kilos. So there's a 21 kilo difference just at weaning. And if you want to put that into a a pretty blunt, harsh dollar terms, $3.50 a kilogram, that's $73 difference in selling. Now, um, I'm not sure, you know, I don't think you're going to have any problem selling these animals, not sure about this. And just, just remember, the, this again, this is roughly a 100 day wait, this is 1st of March. So, if we do the same thing for 12 month live weight, we see that the graph has changed a little bit and that there is now, now actually no overlap between the terminal and the maternal size. But you see, through this middle area here, there's not a lot of difference. And in fact, the top maternal and bottom terminal on our estimated predictions, the difference on average was five grams. So yeah, essentially these two values are the same. So if you're wanting to use a terminal sire, you want to be picking up the top. Otherwise, the, the advantage over the top um, maternal size for your basic growth tray is, is basically nothing. So and when it comes to choosing animals based on breeding values, if you're wanting high growth rates, you need to go to the top for either of those, um, for either of the deer select platforms, regardless of what sire type you're actually choosing. If you want to just target growth, you need to go high. If your system doesn't necessarily need to target growth, then, you know, there are other options. And that's the thing, you've got to bear in mind what your system can actually cope with. So in summary, we've actually got an extremely high heritability for 12 month live weight. And this comes from combining the genotypes. So our actual breeders won't have quite this big an opportunity to work with because they're working within their sire type. So the number they're working with might be down by, say, about a third. And again, 
the, the variation's pretty consistent. And, and these sort of numbers are pretty much consistent through most of our live weight traits. We're talking about a 10% um, coefficient of variation and somewhere around about that 0.6 mark for heritability. So very high heritabilities. And again, the average of the top 10% of progeny was 116 kilos at that 350 days. The average of the bottom 10%, 83. So that's 33 kilograms. That's a big difference. And these are a DPT progeny growing out of the same set of hind, three different hind bases over those three years, but you know, very similar hinds on each year of uh, each of the two years that the farms were growing them. So if you put that at a 760 um, kilogram hot weight, and again, this is a, a pretty dirty, horrible sort of um, analysis, that's $253 difference. Uh, sorry, no, we need to keep questions to the end. That's, that's on hot weight, yep, hot carcass weight. Oh, you're right. Yes, yeah, sorry. Fair, fair point. Um, Jeff, will, Jeff will actually delve into the carcass da data in a little more detail at the end. But yes, no, you're right. I'm afraid this slide was done quite late in the piece. Now, I just wanted to show you a deer select genetic trends graph. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with these, but there's some really important stuff to note about what your breeders have been doing for you as commercial producers. And, and that they've been doing a heck of a good job. So if, if you don't worry about the numbers or anything, but basically the D DPT started down here. And for the three years of the deer progeny test was running, the rate of genetic gain was two and a half times greater than the previous five years. So, you know, th this slope was pretty steep. The last full cohort measured, which is the 2012-2013 um, cohort of all size on deer select, that rate of genetic gain was four and a half times greater than the previous 20 years. So your breeders are out there doing a heck of a good job now on live weight, and you know some of them can do a lot, can, can keep doing better, but the breeders are out there producing these animals, and the opportunity is there for the commercial producers to use these values on deer select and select these animals that are going to work for their system. So in terms of these key messages, there are still big opportunities, I believe, for the industry to capture around growth and um, live weight characteristics. And, and many of you pro pro commercial producers have got a great opportunity, particularly in the short term, to make some very big gains. Um, we are now very close to having this single platform for breeding values so that we have the maternal and the maternal ranked on the same scale so that you can actually see the absolute differences there when you're purchasing size using breeding values. And when you are purchasing size, purchase proven size with breeding values that are going to suit your individual system. Right, so this is where we deviate away from traditional approach of just looking at growth and looking at what value can we add to the carcass. So this is one of the core things that's been driving the uh, new traits in the deer progeny test. So why venison and carcass traits? Well, the obvious answer to that is that venison is the majority income earner for the industry and we really do need to better understand the genetics contributing to our major product. Now there's two things to consider here. One is, can we use this understanding to improve and capture more value in the carcass by focusing on the high value parts of the carcass? But there's another equally important thing to understand is that we, by measuring these traits, and correlating them with the other traits that we're actually selecting for, we can use this to understand whether we are potentially denigrating the quality of the product. It's just as important. So as we actively select for things like rapid growth, are we having an effect on the quality of the meat that we're producing? So we use this data for that as well by what we call a correlation analysis. 
So don't think it's just looking for improving things, it's also preventing us falling into the traps of denigrating the product in its own right. So in the DPT, there were, there were two types of uh, carcass and venison traits that we looked at. The first one are the live animal measures. So this is where we can actually assess the quality of the carcass without destroying the animal. So there's obvious reasons why we want to do that. And the live animal measures that we're focused on are firstly the ultrasound eye muscle area, which is uh, here. So the eye muscle, of course, being the top loin here, the strip loin and uh, x-ray commuter tomography or what we call CT scanning which is uh, obviously more expensive but more informative in the, in the amount of data that we can obtain. So here is an x-ray taken longitudinally that's used by the computer to set the references for doing cross sections through the carcass and from that uh, image there we can calculate the muscle mass and, and, and other distribution of other things like fat and bone as well. A very, very powerful tool. And uh, we, eye muscle area scanned all progeny in the DPT and we did a full CT scan on over 180 of the progeny. A very detailed CT scan. And the other side of it was the, the collection of the carcass data from the progeny at slaughter. And uh, that's where we collected a whole raft of things, including individual muscle weights as well. But basically carcass components uh, and weights, dressing out percentage, meat to bone ratios, muscle weights, certain linear measurements, but also measurements down to the quality of the venison itself, pH, tenderness, colour and drip loss. These are all things that we measured on every single animal that was slaughtered through the DPT. A massive, massive job, I have to say. And without the full support of Alliance staff at the era, DSP uh, slowing down the whole chain to allow us to do it wouldn't have been possible. So what, we, what I'm going to present to you, a lot of this is around the carcass quality, is around the muscle distribution, and so we correct it to a standard carcass weight. So we're not so much interested in the growth side of it at this point. We're interested in the distribution of the muscles at a given weight. So changing the composition of the animal. So venison carcass traits, heritability estimates that I'll give to you are largely being adjusted for hot carcass weight. So we correct everything to a standard hot carcass weight. And the main focus of what we're going to give you today is around the three main primals, the loins, which is high value, the rear legs, which is high, val high value, and the shoulders, which is low value, or on a relative scale. So you realise that if we are going to focus on one of these muscle groups at a standard carcass weight, the other one's got to give. So you don't, you rob Peter to pay Paul in many respects. But we really want to focus on can we select for the high value cuts relative to the low value cuts. And so if we, when we started looking at the analysis of these um, carcasses, firstly just to go into the, the total carcass itself, pre-slaughter live weight as we expected along with the growth traits, uh, a relatively high uh, sorry, heritability of about 0.4 and a good coefficient and variation. And likewise, the hot carcass weight, which is a, almost a function of the growth of the animal live weight anyway, because they're highly correlated. And, but the interesting thing is the dressing out percentage, the relative uh, proportion of the carcass to the live weight. The heritability is quite high but the coefficient variation is incredibly low. So there's not a lot of opportunity to change the dressing proportion based on this data set. So to present it graphically uh, here, so these are absolute weights on this side for these two sets of uh, traits. We see that there, there clearly are absolute differences between the uh, maternal uh, male and terminal female, terminal male remembering that there's no paternal females in this data set, we didn't slaughter them. And likewise, we see it coming through in hot carcass weight. 
But when we look at dressing percentage, which is in the scale here, 55% uh, is pretty well the average across the lot. There's absolutely nothing in it uh, in the difference there. Uh, this goes contrary to a lot of discussion over the years about different dressing out percentage for different breeds of deer. Um, it is only one data set, but it is by far the most comprehensive data set that's ever existed in this space. So um, clearly there's not a lot of opportunity for changing the, uh, the um, dressing percentage. In terms of the hot carcass weight, though, the, the, uh, there's quite substantial difference between the, uh, the value of the top 10% of uh, DPT progeny and the bottom 10%, with that difference being equivalent to 164 kilograms based on the sort of 730 payout, um, which is 19% uh, better or worse than the average of about $442. So you see the variation there that's been generated in just that trade alone. But really, what we're interested in here is these primal joints. And the interesting thing is that there are high heritabilities here and high coefficients of variation. So there's a lot of opportunity here, but it's, it's a little bit more to the story than just that. But firstly, if we uh, look at uh, high value loins, we've got a heritability of about 0.5, that's quite high, and a good coefficient of variation. Similarly, with the high value leg, not quite so high, but but interestingly, the shoulder is a very, very high uh, heritability and a high coefficient of variation. And the total primal meat, that's when you add it all together, um, about 0.49, 10% uh, coefficient of variation. So there's a lot of opportunity to change things here because of the, the coefficients of variation and the heritabilities together. But if we... Not everything has a high correlation, a high uh, heritability, and um, just to explain that, so the strip loin weight, so that's the strip loin minus the bone and minus the tender loins, has incredibly high heritability, and the bone primal shoulder weights even more so. But other things like the um, chill pH and the uh, chill loin weights, I presume. Um, Sorry, have low heritability. Sorry, sorry. have uh, quite low heritability. So what that tells us is that we can't actually achieve a lot genetically. We have to achieve it in our management practices. So as much as anything, it tells us the things we can select for and things we don't waste our time trying to select for uh, that we can use other methods. So this horrible matrix. It's actually a baby matrix. So we've just taken a small sample. I mentioned before when we do correlation matrix, in this particular study, there would be over 10,000 squares filled with numbers there. So rather than present that to you, I've just taken a selection here. And so this is what we call a, uh, a, a correlation matrix, a phenotype genotype correlation matrix. And really, I don't want you to burrow down to all the numbers but just realise we do this across all the traits together. And, and we use this uh, in several ways. And really what it says is we plot one, one trait against the other. If they're positively correlated and head towards a one, then if you change one, you change the other in the same direction. If they're negatively correlated, as you change one, you change the other in the opposite direction. So just using the example in the square here, and, and forget the, the blue numbers for this time, they're just the, they're the heritabilities. But in the, uh, the, the genotypic correlations, what we expect through genetic progress, that if we focus on certain traits, we change other traits as well in a positive and negative direction. The interesting thing here, EMA is eye muscle area, is very highly correlated with loin, as we expect, it's a measure of loin, but it is a very high genetic correlation, means to say we can use eye muscle area to select positively for loin. But at the same time, by using it, we have a negative correlation with shoulder and with rear leg, more so for shoulder, but not much more, 
but positively correlated to a certain extent with overall yield of primal. So what it basically says, I said before, you, you, you rob Paul to pay Peter, um, that if we effectively use eye muscle area, we um, will have a significant effect on improving loin or increasing loin weight and a small effect in decreasing shoulder and, and hind leg, but overall increasing the total primal yield. So what this says straight away, we have a big opportunity to change the top primal in a positive direction. And it's partly, mostly at the expense of the lower value. So there's an opportunity there. Imagine 10,000 little squares there that we have to go through here. A lot of them might be particularly useful to us or meaning or we can write them out, but that's the sort of approach we take. So taking the eye muscle area story a little bit further, um, this is the correlation between hot carcass weight and eye muscle area. And you see there's the straight line in the direction it goes, but you see the variation around it. That variation is the most important aspect of this, really. And if we sort of take a standard, a sort of similar carcass weight, we see there's big variations in the actual weight of the loin, which we measure by looking at the cross-section of it, which is highly correlated. Now, these aren't eye muscle scans. I didn't have good enough pictures to put up there, but they're just slices through the loin at the point at which we would scan them. And although it might not look obvious that there are differences there, they are different. And if you look at the total yield, uh, a 59 kilogram carcass producing three and a half kilogram loin versus a 57 kilogram carcass producing a 4.16 kilogram loin. Big variation. So what's the value proposition of it if we were to go down this path for just increasing loin muscle weight alone, so putting the emphasis on that trait. Um, but for every 100 grams per annum that we add to the loin muscle relative to, to the whole carcass weight, we actually add $1.1 million per annum, and this is permanent gain to, you know, um, to the export revenues. If we assume a biological limit, we know there's a limit, we can't produce just a loin with a pair of legs. You know, the animal won't function. And we assume at about 800 grams, we actually, through that one trade alone, are adding about $8.8 .8 million per annum permanent gain to the industry. And that's only one selection trade. The challenges? Uh, well, firstly, we need to ensure that straight trait selection does not compromise the fundamental biology of the animal. And that's where we use our correlation matrices to check that we're not causing damage. There is a biological limit to how far we can take each trait. And beyond that, then we start to reach a point of um, undesirable effects. So we've got to keep checking it. But importantly, the payment systems need to reward the producers to produce desirable animals with those carcass traits. So anyone paid on just carcass weight alone, as most people are at the moment, how are we going to know? So that's the discussion the industry needs to have between the producers and the processors as to how that can be rewarded. Also, we need to find in line, uh, good inline yield predictors in the plant that can identify these quality traits. So key messages for the venison side of it. Uh, there's a real, very real, real opportunity in deer select or use deer select to focus on high value primals that will add real value to the industry. Eye muscle area um, is a very good measure, so we encourage you to use it more, or the breeders especially, uh, of uh, overall loin and overall high value yield. And we need to further uh, develop the inline measurements of carcass. With that, I'll hand over to Jamie to cover the co-products. Right, so time's tight. Um we could either hear about co-products or rush into some questions. I'm not sure which one we want to do, but we'll then carry on. So why are we interested in co-products? Uh, co-products, which includes all the lovely skins you saw out there from New Zealand light leathers, they're a very, very valuable part of the industry, as was highlighted this morning. Um, admittedly, my figures are a bit old, but for the four years, 2007 to 11, 
Co-products averaged 11.4% of our export returns, and that was more than Velvet averaged. And in 2011 alone, and I know the leather thing has changed now, but leather and hides were worth $25 million export revenue for the New Zealand industry. So there is real value in investigating these components of your venison production system. Now, tails are the most valuable um, co-product by unit weight, and the value range from them's basically nothing to about $60 or more each. Pizzles are less valuable, but as a generalisation, $6 to $10 each. And skins, again, historically, potentially were very valuable. And, and they, they range from a cost to actually get them through to potentially 100 bucks each. If we say it's halved, even now it's still 50 bucks each. Graphically, the um, terminal males for tails were 4.1% lighter than the maternal males. And um, these maternal males are only 6.5% heavier than the terminal females. And I, I think we all know that um, the wapiti type has a, a smaller tail in, to body size than the red type. So if we adjusted this for carcass weight, those differences between the maternal and maternal would increase even more. Pizzle size, not such an interesting story. It's about the same. The difference is about 4%. So... Basically, every, everything's in proportion for the, for the two sire types, and the girls don't have any. Now, in regard to those puzzles, there was, there was a reasonable heritability and a, quite a lot of variation. In terms of the ones for the DPT, there was very little difference in our puzzle grading. Most of our puzzles ranged between about um, 100 grams and about 230. So they, they were in the sort of medium weight grade. So pretty much the top and bottom percent were still averaged at around about eight bucks all up. There, there wasn't a lot of extreme. We had, we had the odd big one, but, um, and, and we didn't actually have any small ones, grade-wise. Um, in terms of the tails, the heritability is even higher again, and the variation is massive. And as I said, some of that's probably down due to breed. Now, using some dirty figures of my own, um, I, I had the average top 10% of tails worth nearly about 50 bucks, and the bottom 10% worth about 24. And again, our tails for the DPT were all actually pretty good sizes. I think the smallest tail was only about 90 grams, but on average they, aver they averaged 230 grams. So they weren't bad sized tails at all. So the extremes for the um, other venison producers are likely to be, particularly down the bottom end, I suspect they'll be lower. But that is a difference of $26. Now, the question is, as Jeff has said with the venison stuff, is there value in trying to capture this difference for the industry? Remember, that's between the top and bottom 10% only. Skins, again, potentially very high value product. We only did the skin work for one year. We did that in conjunction with New Zealand Light Leathers and Lazra. It was quite an expensive piece of work, but we found some interesting stuff that is... Um, world first according to the leather people. So we found a sire effect on some a very important skin traits. So it was noticeably the tear strength of the leather, which is critical for manufacturing options, the skin pearl evenness, which is the grain of the leather, if you look at those ones out there, and um, the grade. And of course, all of those are tied in. And because of the grade, hence the value. So there is an opportunity to capture more value from the top skins, but it is difficult because the skins need to be processed before we can actually see what quality they um, represent at present. So there's opportunities to select for better co-products, particularly probably the heavier tails. S um, skins do have some important fa facets that we could investigate down the line, um, and potentially this could add to that overall carcass value that was mentioned this morning by Glenn, I think. So... In terms of impacts, this is only a very small subset, as Jeff has said, as what we've actually looked at of the DPT. And the, we, we can look at this data a million ways till Friday, and there's a lot of other things we can look at to help the industry capture value. We've got ongoing analysis, and there will be other opportunities come out of this for the venison industry to, to capture using some of the traits we've measured, and that hopefully to add good profitability to venison production systems. So there's health traits, likes of the Carla, We've got the temperament work ongoing, and 
the reproductive stuff's just about to come online. We're about to pregnancy scan the last of the DPT R2s, and there'll be a whole lot of stuff we haven't even thought of yet. Now, this has been a massive industry effort. There's been so many people involved in this across so many different parts of the industry. These are all the partner herds that contributed the um, sires and the, the sire semen, and they measured these animals in their own herds and recorded them all on Deer Select. And just to acknowledge, again, this is only a tiny list of them people, but the DPT farmers and, and their farm owners, so there's the Boyds and, and the Clissers, there's um, the, the, um, the Stevens and the Sierras, and of course Invermay, and all those DPT partner herds. The, the people that funded this, as Danny said, Deer Research, Alliance Group, Landcorp, and AgriSearch, and all the foundation members of that DPT committee that set this thing up and got it rolling, which then transitioned over to the Deer Select group, and all the staff at the Makariwa plant. As Danny said, they put in a massive effort to help us get these measurements done, and of course there's been quite a lot of AgriSearch staff involved as well. So thanks to everyone. Um, just thank you very much to Jamie and Jeff for their presentation. This is part of uh, something that was done before the P2P started back in 2010 when a group of farmers and AgriSearch got together and developed this project. Um, and you can see here we're on this conference we've been talking about the market and trying to add value to the market. Now we're actually trying to also show you where we can add value actually directly to the farm and we're actually seeing some really good benefits coming out of this project already and a lot more to come. Very quickly, we've probably got time for a couple more questions, if there is any questions for them. Jeff. Jeff, you mentioned that, um, that uh, there's been great value from this for the linkages uh, with their select. Um, this was a three-year project. Where to from here? Yeah, our, our concern, uh, Wayne, was that um, once the DPT finished, that linkage would start falling apart. So what we did is we put in place uh, Son of DPT, which was called Deerlink, and that's been operating for two years. Its, it's real focus is on maintaining linkage, but it's not just... A, uh, a DPT type operation. We do have a, a, a central herd based at Invermay, but it's also putting in place the means by which the stud breeders exchange genetic material each year. In actual fact, we set it up for three years. We probably have done our last year of AI because the farmer component of it's working. So we didn't want to pull out from the DPT and let all the linkage fall apart and get back to square one again. And I, I don't think that will happen anymore. But just as a deer select chairman, we have to be careful as farmers to actually um, support the deer link. We can't just leave it to AgriSearch. It means farmers have to swap some of the genetics around as well. Another one? In the middle there, can't see what it is. Any traits? Yoni's traits. As whether we tested for Yoni's traits. So no, we, we didn't test for Yoni's traits. The, the key focus for this was venison production. So we, did, we couldn't be all things to all people. And, and if we went in for Yoni's traits, there was a risk of compromising the health of a large number of animals that we then, then couldn't go on and evaluate any of their other traits. Now I know that's the reality in a, in a production system. But um, the, the feeling was that the venison traits were, were the more critical thing to attend to when the DPT kicked off. I'll I, I just make a comment too, that don't think that genetic stops with the end of the DPT. It doesn't. So I'm actually putting in place the, at the moment the, the five-year plan for the uh, hitting targets program, which will probably have about 50% of its uh, budget in this genetic space. And one of the outcomes from the DPT is the opportunity to look at a whole raft of new traits that we hadn't had the opportunity to, to before or we haven't even thought of yet. So what we're planning to do is to set up what we call the Tomorrow Deer Program where we will look at 
all these different traits, including traits for animal well-being and health. And so yonis is one of those. Uh, parasitism is another one. And we're working with Frank Griffin to develop what we call biomarkers of health. And these are things that we potentially can select animals to be more resilient, uh, resilient and resistant to disease rather than fighting disease all the time. So this is the power of genetics. And so that's the next wave, the new generation of uh, study that we're doing at the moment. And Yone sits up there as one of the biomarkers that we'll be looking at. Right, last question, Patty. Um, I would plead that we don't actually end the DPT trials. I'd like to keep this thing alive. I think we've done um, a hell of a lot of investment over three years. It's got to be kept alive, even if it's only one or two sires a year. Somehow we've got to find money to keep this thing alive. It's, um, it's a dead program two years later if we put it on a shelf. Thank you. Now, I think we all can agree that um, with the weaning weights that we showed with Jamie at $73 at $3.50, if you equate that out to $4.20, which I think was the average at the Weaner Fair in Wairau this year, is $88 a head. And I think it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realise that there is actually some really good gains being made and can be made on farm today in line with what's happening in the marketplace. And thank you for Jamie and Jeff and to all those partner herds and Alliance and all the others that were involved. Thank you.